because they did and they do in the third world things that they don't do in the first world. So it's a double standard that they have. Well, according to Chevron, and I've spoken to them, they said that they operated very cleanly, just, <laughs> well, just as they do in the U.S. Okay, yes. I'm telling you what they're saying. And also Cinderella like exit and a lot of things, you and, know. <laughs> and they blame your oil company. They say it's that, your That is fault. not true. Of course, our oil company has also done a lot of damage in the rainforest, but it is very clear that the problem uh, comes from the Chevron Texaco period, okay? Texaco period, because at the beginning it was just Texaco. So there are a lot of evidence about that. Well, but here's the problem. First of all, can they get a fair trial here? They say that there's no chance that they can get a fair trial here. Well, always there is a, a pre pretext excuse in order to avoid uh, the responsibilities, you know. We, we think that they can have a fair trial here. And I cannot. The evidence is there, of course. They are blaming our oil company, but before our oil company took over the exploitation, the damage was there. If your courts rule against Chevron Texaco, how in the world are you going to collect? They have nothing here. How is little Ecuador going to collect against big Chevron? Well, that will be a, a problem. It's not a public lawsuit. It's a lawsuit followed by indigenous communities from the Amazonia. Anyway, uh, we go to support them in order to collect the money if they win the lawsuit. But, uh, well, that would be a precedent because we can do the same thing with if, for instance, Occidental, a lot of oil companies are, uh, are, um, uh, are following lawsuits against the Ecuadorian government. So we can follow the same strategy you want. How in the world they can collect the money? Well, it's a... A demonstration effect. Huh? So I think the own United States, the own international community, should impose to Chevron Texaco the, if you want, the moral duty of paying this money. Well, besides the moral duty, there are no Chevron assets in Ecuador anymore. Of course. But there are billions in Chevron assets in Venezuela. Will your Friend Hugo Chavez <laughs> help you collect if your citizens win? You know, it's not a government problem. It's not our lawsuit. It's a private lawsuit. So, but I think there is a moral issue here. So, it's not possible to have this kind of impunity if this indigenous community win the lawsuit against Chevron Texaco. So, in this case, we think that the moral duty of the international community is to push to Chevron Texaco in order to pay this money. Will you call on President Chavez or others to help um, you enforce, protect your citizens and your I will, I will call the whole international community. Always you are giving us uh, moral speeches, uh, <laughs> uh, advice about economic policy, uh, social policy, environmental policy, moral policy, etc. So we are sure that in this case you're going to support these indigenous communities against a huge, a big, a very powerful transnational, Chevron Texaco. Do you think that the U.S. government is going to support your attack, your government's attack, your people's attack on the oil company it's that not Condoleezza an, Rice came from? It's not an attack, it's justice. So we expect, yes, we hope, hope that the U.S. government supports the, uh, this, if you want, this claim. Now, you've thrown Occidental Petroleum out. You have forced Chevron Texaco out of your country. What is Ecuador's problem with U.S. oil companies? What is the problem of the U.S. company with Ecuador? <laughs> because we are not crazy. If we are, if our indigenous people are uh, fighting against Chevron Texaco, it's for something, you know. Um, you can see our rainforest before Petro Ecuador. It's not true that the fault is 
of is in Petro Ecuador. You know, before Petro Ecuador, we already had a lot of damage in, the, in our rainforest. And also, with Occidental, it's very clear that they uh, break up their contracts and the Ecuadorian law. So it's not that we have something against foreign investment, foreign companies or U.S. companies, but there are some companies that used to do in our countries things that they will never do in their own, comp or, or own countries. This is a big change in Ecuador. I don't think I would have heard this, phrase, the, this talk from a prior president of 10 years ago. What, what What's I, changed? Why suddenly, before, you had presidents that embraced Occidental, that embraced Chevron. Ecuador is no longer in sale, you know? Now Ecuador has a sovereign a nationalist government. That is the huge difference. Difference, sorry. Yeah, very, very different. Now, does that... Now, one of the things, though, is that Hugo Chavez has just lost a big vote. Evo Morales is facing a revolt in Bolivia. Is this really the end of the populist left in Latin America? I don't know why or what you used to call populist left. Our left is not populist. It's a very technical one. But it's very popular. That is different, <laughs> you know? And perhaps that is not understood in the States. Anyway, uh, any change in Latin America, the most unequal region in the world, will face a lot of, uh, of obstruction, of problems. But it's, we, we have to continue because these changes are necessary. But there are still very powerful groups against any change. Why? Because they, they, are, they have been very, very, very well in this situation, very unfair situation with poverty, etc. So it's, it's, uh, it's uh, normal. Uh, perhaps normal is not exactly war. Is uh, you want, we can expect to have this opposition, very strong opposition, of these group groups of interests because they go to to lose their privileges. Do you think that the United States is backing the privileged classes? Sometimes, yes. <laughs> Do you think that that's part of your problem with the Bush administration? We don't have any problem with Bush administration. Well, we respect a lot of the U.S. government, but sometimes, of course, about foreign policy, we have to comment on that. And I think that uh, most part of the world, of the international community, for instance, criticize the Iraq invasion. So these kind of things we can comment on, but we don't have any problem with the Bush government. Well, but the Bush government has a problem with you. I noticed that Condoleezza Rice and the Bush government made it very clear that they didn't like you being appointed finance minister in the last government. Obviously, they can't be happy with you being president. No, no, I, I didn't know that. Mm -hmm. Perhaps international organizations uh, didn't or uh, were not too happy about my nomination. For instance, World Bank, IMF, etc. But I didn't know that the Bush administration uh, was not happy with my nomination. Anyway, I don't care about that. So. Yes, well, uh, are you saying that Paul Wolfowitz was not happy with your policies here in Ecuador? Uh, the president of the World Bank? I didn't talk to Paul Wolfowitz, but I talked to, I don't remember the name of the vice president of the World Bank, and I realized very well that she wasn't happy with me. <laughs> now, wait a minute. But was reciprocal, The president you know? of Ecuador, Rafael Correa, uh, interviewed in Quito by investigative journalist Greg Pallast. And that does it for our broadcast. Democracy Now! produced by Mike Bershaw, Fodou Kudou, Saren Mate, Angeli Kama, Jeffrey Higgins, Steve Martinez, Nicole Salazar, Abby Karen. I'm Amy Goodman. Thanks so much for joining us.